We tied the knot at a relatively mature age, I was 29 and she was 32, and that was six years ago. Before our paths crossed, we both lived life to the fullest, but unfortunately our wallets didn't feel the same. During the premarital conversation, we openly stated our common desire to have children, and that Julie would be a mom, until our youngest child went to school. We unanimously agreed that having a dedicated parent at home would significantly improve our child's overall well-being, if only our financial situation would allow it. As a result, until the day came when we met our little ones, we knew that we needed to prepare for the uncertainty of lean years by saving enough money. To achieve this, Julie and I decided to work full-time, and I took on as much overtime as possible. We started working two shifts on Fridays, and on Saturdays we stayed up late and worked for another 12 hours. Our hard work bore fruit. We were able to fully own our home and watch our bank account grow steadily. But recently, there has been talk of having children in the near future. Although Julie was not yet 40 years old, we understood how important it was to think about this decision as early as possible. In order not to reduce the chances of conceiving our first child, we had an unusual conversation on Thursday evening. Dave, I'd like to discuss the possibility of a tentative breakup. Could you pronounce the word distrustful for me? I was so surprised that my head went blank, and all I could say was what? Those of you who have experienced being dumped by a partner can understand this feeling. The person initiating the breakup usually has everything planned and mentally prepared, and the one who is abandoned is caught off guard. At that very moment, I was unprepared and confused. Consequently, my subsequent statement carried the same level of intellectual stimulation. The reason for this? I just think it's good for us to be together. It's hard to deny, Dave, that you no longer have the same level of romanticism and don't seem to appreciate me as much. You often claim that you are too tired to go on dates more than once a month. The frequency of our intimate meetings has decreased from four times a week, which used to be the norm, and to be honest, you've put on a little weight. Of course, you will agree that a short break would be good for both of us. How about taking a month off, Dave? At this time, I will be staying with Frida, you can contact me whenever you want, but I think it would be better if we limit ourselves to personal meetings once a week. If we meet more often, it won't provide us with the necessary space, will it? But know, Dave, that my love for you is unshakable, and I have no doubt that we will have wonderful children. I am sure that within a month, maybe two at most, we will be back in the same place where we were before. With that, Julia got up from her seat. Julie picked up two suitcases and headed for the door. I stuttered, feeling powerless. I don't have the right to vote, Julie. Reluctantly, she answered. I've made my decision, Dave. Please have a seat. I couldn't help but ask, who is he, Julie? I anticipated her response. God, I knew you'd draw that conclusion. I just confessed my love for you, Dave, and only for you. There is no one else in my heart so you don't have to invade my privacy by tapping my phones, spying on me, installing a GPS tracker in my car, or even hiring a private investigator. In fact, if you resort to any of these actions, I can take this as a lack of trust in me and a reason to reconsider our relationship. When she tried to get up again, I squeezed her hand tightly and forced her to stay in place. It's not fair, Julie. You had enough time to prepare your well-rehearsed monologue and calculate the risks, while I am completely unfamiliar with all this. What exactly is the risk, Dave? I found solace in the fact that her face finally reflected the embarrassment I was feeling. You have to understand, Julia, that your unilateral actions have put our relationship at risk. The air around her is saturated with contempt. I have always considered you my equal partner in our relationship, and would never have made such a risky decision without asking your opinion. What kind of risk are you talking about, Dave? We both love each other, so why should it be a problem? It's just for a short period of time, and if I start missing you sooner, I'll come right back. I don't quite understand what you mean by contempt. It seems to me that you didn't give me a chance to explain myself. For example, we rarely go out together because I work overtime on Fridays and Saturdays. 
we agreed to work overtime to improve our financial situation. We don't have intimate relationships as often as we used to, mainly because we've been married for six years, and partly because of my constant stress state. I gained weight because you suggested that I take on the role of supervisor to earn additional income, which, as I now understand, is not a practical job choice. This is something that's been bothering me lately, so could you stay so we can talk about it? I'm sorry, Dave. I've arranged to meet Frida tonight, so I have to fulfill this commitment. After saying these words, she got up, gathered her things and headed for the exit. Always remember, Julie, that you're married, I reminded her, watching as she headed for the exit without hesitation. The next day I returned to work at 10 a.m., taking with me sandwiches made from a week's supply of bread. In the late afternoon I went to the convenience store on the corner to buy some necessities. When I got home at 11.30 p.m., I noticed a flashing message light on my phone. It was a sincere message from Julie, in which she expressed longing for me and gratitude that I had given her the opportunity to refrain from calling. I was starting to get upset because I was working tirelessly, saving three times more money than she did, while she was enjoying her social life. It was funny that it had never bothered me before. Surprisingly, we didn't talk to each other on Sunday. On Monday, I approached my boss and expressed regret that I would not be able to work overtime for some time. Julie finally called me on Wednesday, and I couldn't help feeling guilty for not contacting her first. To calm my conscience, I decided to visit Frida after dinner on Thursday. As a sign of reconciliation, I came with a bouquet of flowers and a box of chocolates. Frida, who was Julie's closest friend, went through a divorce just over a year ago. Although the reasons for their separation remained unclear to me, I guessed that they could be connected with Frida's betrayal. When I arrived, Frida informed me that Julie was taking a shower now, so I settled on the couch and she took a seat next to me. I was uncomfortable with such proximity, and I quietly moved away, hoping to create some distance. Unfortunately, Frida did not give up and continued to approach. Fortunately, Julie came down at that moment, saving me the embarrassment. Without delay, I handed Julia a bouquet of flowers and a box of chocolates. The exchange of opinions between us was intense, unlike our usually casual conversations. After some casual chatter, she asked, Dave, do you need something? Her question caused me slight perplexity. No, I just wanted to take my wife for a walk tomorrow night, I replied. Unfortunately, Frida and I already have some business, she replied. It suddenly dawned on me that tomorrow is Friday night, when I usually work. But you work on Fridays, I said. Not anymore. I decided to make family and physical well-being my top priorities, I said, leaving her to reflect on the financial consequences of such a decision. After receiving your message last Saturday at about 11.30 p.m., in which you mentioned a walk, I saw clearly and realized how stupid I had been, driving myself to extreme exhaustion. Just the day before on Friday, I was so exhausted that I thought I might collapse right there at work. Julia, stunned by my condition, came up to me and gave me a comforting hug. Please don't be offended, my love, but in a few months, I will need your help in conceiving a child. However, the atmosphere was sharply disrupted when Frida returned and spoiled the mood. I'm sorry, Dave, but the girls will be at the Tupperware training camp soon. I hurried away. Some attractions are simply not meant for the eyes. Julie saw me off when I left. I couldn't help but tell her, Please, Julie, come home. I miss your presence. Her reply saddened me. Three more weeks, Dave, and then we can talk. I couldn't help but notice the discomfort written on her face, as if she didn't like saying those words. Any glimmer of hope for reconciliation disappeared as she continued. Why don't you take a break from overtime for a month to recover? We really need this money, Dave. I looked at the flowers and sweets, still left unattended where she had carelessly thrown them away, and I left in silence. The following week, during my usual visit on Tuesday evening, Julia was in the shower again. Learning from my previous mistake, I decided to sit on the couch. Frida, fully dressed, came up to me and spoke in close proximity, making me feel anxious. Soon Julie came down the stairs, 
also dressed, and looked slightly embarrassed. She explained that I should have called in advance, as they were planning to leave. Feeling not only awkward, but also humiliated at being asked to leave, I couldn't help but wonder if I'd heard a giggle coming from behind the closed door. I solemnly promised myself that I would never allow myself to be humiliated again. In the days that followed, we both refrained from communicating with each other. On Sunday, I devoted time to training in the backyard. I made improvised kettlebells and already felt my strength returning to its former splendor. Suddenly, I felt someone's hands behind me, someone's body pressed against my sweaty back. It was a wonderful feeling to feel human contact after two weeks of loneliness. But the joy turned to shock when Frida's voice sounded very close to my ear. I'm sorry, my dear, but your charming charm was simply irresistible. Stunned, I hurriedly turned away trying to get out of the situation. Trying to hide my embarrassment and not out of genuine friendliness, I asked if she would like to have a cup of coffee. I couldn't help but notice that Frida was wearing one of her typical provocative outfits, although I have to admit that it accentuated her wonderful cleavage. I went in and sat on the edge of the kitchen table, but it turned out to be ineffective. Frida quickly pulled a chair closer to me, so close that our feet touched. I'm not really good at making meaningless conversations, so when we chatted about nothing, I felt out of place. I couldn't help but ask if you were going to ask about Julie's well-being but I quickly realized that she had made it clear that it was none of my business. A smile appeared on Frida's face as she spoke. In a somewhat mischievous tone, she noted that Julie was feeling a little upset. Apparently, she hoped that I would already beg and beg for forgiveness. Unfortunately, Frida, this is not my approach. You see, when I first came to you, I plucked up the courage and asked Julie out on a date. But she refused me citing pre-existing plans. I noticed that she never called to reschedule the meeting and showed no interest in it. I am completely unaware of the reason for this separation, so I will patiently wait for her return or the dissolution of our marriage. I assumed that everything I reported would be passed on to Julia. When Frida heard my last remark, I expected her to be worried, but she just smiled and put her hand on my leg. Perhaps this is some kind of exam. I was sure that I would pass it because I had no emotional attachment to Frida. But her appearance was completely different. I noticed that another button on her top had mysteriously come undone. Did you know that I've always looked at you and Julie as a couple? I wonder if you need to be completely confident in your love to let her date other guys? Or are you just pretending that you don't care? A chill ran down my spine. We didn't discuss dating during this one-sided breakup, but my reminder, don't forget you're married, should have been understood. Without saying a word, I rushed out of the house and jumped into the car. When I arrived at Frida's house, I immediately rushed inside. Through the kitchen window, I saw Julie sunbathing on the terrace in a bikini. I walked resolutely forward, heading for the exit. Julie, could you explain what nonsense Frida is telling me about your dates? I clarified. Last Tuesday we just met a few guys at a club and danced by chance. Although we mentioned the possibility of meeting them again, it certainly wasn't considered an official date. I expected Julie to react worriedly, defending herself against these accusations. But to my surprise, she looked determined. What happened last night, my dear? I asked. Nothing? she replied, keeping a determined look on her face. We were just dancing, without any vulgarity. There were no kisses. They just bought us drinks and we enjoyed dancing. But I doubt the propriety of a married woman dancing with other men in the absence of her husband. It seems strange to me. I hope you casually mention to them that you will see them again on your next visit. But if you meet them again, it will undoubtedly be considered a date and will be extremely inappropriate. Julie, I want you to understand that this situation is causing me deep pain. I'm still not sure about the reasons for our separation. How about we fast forward two weeks and return home immediately? I really miss your presence. Unfortunately, Dave, the time has not come yet. It looks like we'll need another month before my old feelings for you resume. It's strange, I know. 
But among all her recent irrational actions, it was this statement that puzzled me the most. I just stared at her for a moment longer and then got up to leave. You can always ask me out on another date, you know? Maybe you'll get lucky this time. I said it sharply without thinking. Or you can take the opportunity to ask me out, given that you know where I live. Starting on Monday, Julie started calling me at home every night. But these conversations were invariably short and awkward. I got the impression that she was just checking my presence at home, which didn't suit me. On Friday evening, she unexpectedly called at 7 o'clock in the evening. The use of redirecting the home phone to a cell phone, as I had previously programmed, turned out to be extremely effective. I could clearly hear the music playing in the background. I had almost reached Frida's house when suddenly something interrupted my progress. After making sure that Julie's car was gone, I set off on a 10-minute drive to Frida's house. But as I got closer, I noticed Julie's car in the parking lot of a nearby bar. Intrigued, I fixed my gaze on the window of the bar, patiently waiting for further developments. In the end, I saw Julie and Frida sitting together in a booth and seemed to be deep in conversation about something. To my surprise, they were joined by two more girls, one of whom vaguely resembled another Julie acquaintance, Deborah. The identity of the second girl completely eluded me. While the company was making acquaintances, I took advantage of the fact that they were distracted and quietly made my way to the far corner of the bar, hiding at the opposite end. With a lot of effort, I made out most of what was said. Deborah kept saying, You're crazy, Julie. Judging by your words, Dave is much more romantic than my husband. Another voice, presumably belonging to a stranger, added, I think so too. I'd be killed by half of what you say you get from your ex. Then Frida intervened. Don't you think Julie deserves something better? She's beautiful, Deborah said. I do not know, but it seems to me that this is too dangerous a game. How do you feel about him, Julie? It seems that the man is working overtime, which means that a significant part of his time is wasted. As an example, we can cite the case when a man spends all Sunday in bed doing intimate things. If this man belonged to me, that's exactly what I would do. Julie spoke in a low tone, and I couldn't understand her answer, as it lasted quite a long time. When Julie finished, I could only make out Deborah resuming the conversation. At the same time, the jukebox turned on, and the bar began to fill up quickly with visitors. I was thinking about the imminent arrival of these gentlemen, wondering when they would appear. Over the next hour, I watched as a lot of men approached the girls, trying to strike up a conversation. But they all left disappointed and unsuccessful. Suddenly, a stranger walking towards the bar caught my attention. When she approached my corner, I kindly made room for her. Smiling affably, she caught my eye and began ordering four drinks. As she stood next to me, I couldn't help but notice her captivating appearance, charming short brown curls and a relaxed smile. While I was waiting for the drinks to be prepared, she turned to me. Are you a regular customer here? Oh, that should have been my question. Well, you're in no hurry. We had a casual conversation until the drinks arrived. I noticed that she was looking curiously at my ring finger. Due to my profession, I rarely wear a ring. It took me by surprise. Look, the discussion at my table is just terrible. Would you mind if I used you as an excuse to escape? What? How can I object to a nice girl talking to me? What are you thinking about? But I consider it my duty to inform you that I am married, although my marriage is currently in a difficult situation. That's the reason I'm here. Oh, I appreciate your honesty. I just want to chat, so if you don't mind, I'd love to have a chat with you. Smiling mischievously, she quickly returned a couple of minutes later. For the next hour and a half, we had a casual conversation. I was constantly looking around, making sure that we were alone. My attention was attracted by the fact that the man took an empty seat at the next table and generously bought drinks for everyone. Sarah was a charming person, and our time together was very enjoyable. At 11.30 p.m., Deborah came up to us. I saw her when it was too late to hide myself. 
There was a faint expression of confusion on her face, and I could relate to that feeling. She recognized me, but she couldn't remember where. When Sarah introduced us to each other, a smile played on my lips. She whispered something in Sarah's ear, and I was sure it was exactly what I needed. You're right, he's attractive. Julie kindly offered to give us a ride home. You need a ride, she offered. Sarah's face betrayed her inner conflict. I really have to go, she hesitated. It was nice talking to you, Sarah. I kissed her gently on the cheek, which made her cheeks turn rosy. She timidly walked away, but halfway to the exit she turned around and handed me a business card. Her silence said a lot, but her smile said it all. When I watched all three girls leave, Frida and the guy stayed at the table. Deciding to give them a little head start, I left them for five minutes and headed for the parking lot. To my surprise, my mobile phone rang just two minutes later. Glancing at the caller ID, I noticed that it was Julie calling from a forwarded home phone. After exchanging greetings, she curiously asked what kind of music was playing during our conversation. Hi, Julie. I'm at the bar right now. I spend the evening talking to an amazing woman. What's up, Dave? Who gave you permission to do this? Are you implying that you are the only one who is free today? Are you implying that I am not free? Obviously, I'm free. As long as we're married, I expect you to behave accordingly. Didn't you call me from the bar? Yeah, and I guess those guys from last time didn't come, right? No, well, maybe. Look, Dave, I've already told you that I'm not interested in dating. It was quite funny to watch her confusion. Hey, Julie, can we stop pretending and go back to how it was before? Come home, I'll be waiting for you. There was a moment of silence. Actually, Dave, I'm sorry, but I'm not ready for this yet. Okay, then. Can we spend the night at my place? No, I'm sorry, Dave. I'll call you later. I returned to thinking about the significance of everything I had discovered that evening. Although I didn't have a clear understanding, it seemed that the situation was getting out of control. On Saturday afternoon, Frida appeared again. I asked her friend's motives, feeling perplexed. But she denied her guilt, albeit unconvincingly. This time, when she tried to kiss me, I was ready. I kept her at a distance, doubting her intentions. What are you trying to achieve, Frida? For God's sake, I'm married to your closest friend. I've made my position clear, Dave. I just wanted to check if a relationship was possible between us after Julie left. It looked so intrusive that it became comical, but it only reinforced my initial suspicions. So, if Julie had left me, would you have continued the relationship with me, Frida? I asked. Yes, Dave. I sincerely hope that you are ready for this. I expressed my strong discomfort about the situation and continued to escort her out of the room. Frida didn't want to leave, but in the end, I had to be blunt and point out the inappropriateness of her behavior. Are you and Julie planning to go out again tonight? Yes, I suppose so. That was the end of our farewell conversation. I dialed Sarah's number and she seemed happy to hear from me but said she couldn't come tonight. She suggested Tuesday instead. I felt it necessary to confirm my position once again. Look, Sarah, we should just stay friends. I am currently in difficult personal circumstances, but I must express my sincere admiration for your company the previous evening. Rest assured, I will treat you with the utmost respect until these issues are resolved. After admitting that she enjoyed our conversation and admitting that she had a difficult situation herself, she ended the conversation looking forward to our meeting on Tuesday. The beginning of a new dynamic of relations with Julia began on Monday morning. She started contacting me at 6 a.m. every weekday and again around 6 p.m., which coincided with my usual return from work. Once again, before going to bed, she stated that she longed for my presence, but at the same time rejected my requests to return. It became obvious that I was being tested. On Tuesday, Sarah was waiting for me at the entrance to her apartment, and we left without delay. She looked amazing. Immediately after we sat down in the restaurant, I started a conversation. Do you want to enlighten me about the difficulties in your personal life? I asked. Her name is Hannah, she replied. It turned out that Hannah was Sarah's three-year-old daughter. 
Sarah's father came to the conclusion that family life is too serious. Her mother took over looking after her today. Hoping to distract her attention from delving into my personal problems, I quickly changed the subject. Recalling our conversation at the bar, you mentioned that there was a terrible discussion at your table. Could you tell us more about this? Everything seemed to revolve around lousy conversations and people without intelligence. Among them, a certain Julie stood out, who recently went through a temporary separation from her husband. But despite her stupidity, she was determined to make peace with him. They were on the verge of starting a family, and she decided to break up with him in order to provoke him to fight for their relationship. She hoped that he would shower her with affection, romance, and pamper her. But unfortunately, when she described his actions in detail, it turned out that he was already overdoing it. He diligently brought her flowers every week, took her on monthly dates, and constantly spoiled her. Even if he worked late on Saturdays, he would wake up early on Sundays to cook a special breakfast for her. Last year, he surprised her with a cruise, which made me envy my ex's efforts. My friend Deb felt the same way. She never gets such extravagant gestures. I guess some girls don't know how to appreciate their lucky circumstances. The situation becomes even more absurd, because even when they were still together, she purposely stayed at the bachelorette parties later and later to provoke his jealousy. She deliberately used men's cologne and even accepted a pair of provocative panties from her friend Frida. These panties were usually intended for her lover, which emphasized their scandalous nature. She quietly put them on the bedroom floor, hoping that her husband would not notice. I was amazed at how inattentive he was, either because of his naivety or because of his overwhelming love for his wife. When this tactic did not elicit the desired reaction, he and his girlfriend developed a trial divorce plan. The idea was to make her husband realize what he could lose and fight fervently to preserve their marriage. But the man remained indifferent. Since he didn't react properly, they decided to step up their actions. She stopped contacting him, and he ignored her. Then she persuaded her friend to inspire him with the idea that she was in a new relationship. Despite all their efforts, he remained unresponsive. To be honest, I find his behavior admirable. It's exactly the same as what I would do if someone did that to me. Still, it saddened me when Deb questioned how much effort she had personally put into their marriage. At that moment, Julie suddenly realized the glaring imbalance in her relationship. One would have expected that this epiphany would inspire her to put an end to all nonsense, but strangely enough, this did not happen. As a result, they found themselves in a dangerous situation, not knowing what to do next, and all because of the stubbornness of one proud man who refuses to obey their rules. Maybe Julie should think about going back to him, confessing everything and trying to restore a normal life. It seems that deep down she really wants it, and I would personally do so. I suspect that her friend is distorting the truth. Last Friday, Frida cast a few ambiguous glances at her friend. Perhaps the friend is trying to create tension between them in order to woo Frida's husband for herself. You may have caught something. This behavior is consistent with what I have witnessed, although, of course, it paints her as unfriendly and calculating. If you were in this husband's place, what would you do? Although I can't say for sure how their relationship has developed so far, my initial instinct would be to separate myself from someone who is exhibiting irrational and stupid behavior. Let's find someone who will truly appreciate him. As soon as the food arrived, we turned the conversation to safer topics. I was struck by how at ease I was with Sarah. But when the waitress put away our empty glasses, my moral compass told me to stop pretending. You know, Sarah, I began, everything you've said makes me believe that you're genuinely kind and have strong moral principles. Grateful for the compliment, she replied, thank you, good sir. Do you consider me an honest person? Without thinking, Sarah answered quickly, I am very proud of my ability to accurately assess the character of people and I can say with confidence that you are truly admirable. I have to admit that what I'm about to say is not easy for me. Trying to prevent her from running away, I reached out and grabbed her arms tightly across the table. Summoning all my courage, 
I plunged into the conversation. Sarah, I have to apologize to you because I was somewhat dishonest. Let me make it clear that my intentions are dictated by my current state of confusion, and I am ready to do whatever it takes to alleviate this confusion. It is important to me that you understand my deep respect for you, and therefore I am forced to reveal the whole truth. Let me introduce myself properly. My name is Dave, and I've been happily married to Julie for six years now. But just four weeks ago, she surprised me by stating her desire to have a trial breakup, despite my initial objections. Recently, a new acquaintance suggested that I end the relationship because of the huge disrespect and the huge pain that Julie causes me. I must admit that I have always treated her with the utmost care and respect, but it was only now that I realized how little she reciprocated me. I watched Sarah's constantly changing expression, but in the end, horror showed on her face. She tightly closed her mouth with a clenched fist, making me doubt my previous actions. Did I really call your wife in such humiliating terms? Deep down I knew she had qualities that I didn't like. But I was struck by the fact that your initial reaction was not related to my false insults against you, but to how you could take revenge on me. This only confirms that you are admirable. Can you find the strength in your heart to forgive me? I admit that you could use our relationship to some extent, but I understand the reasons for this. Is that why you came to me on Friday night? Were you looking for a spy? Hey, it's me you were talking to, remember? Can I count on your friendship until we find a solution to this case, whichever way it goes? Of course, Dave, but I can only offer you my friendship. I have no desire to interfere in your marriage or cause any harm. Thank you. Your friendship is all I need at the moment. From my point of view, our marriage seemed absolutely happy, and there were no signs that Julia was unhappy. But one Thursday, after returning from work, she surprised me by asking for a trial divorce. She was on the verge of leaving, but I insisted on getting at least some explanation from her. I'm still confused, even when I put all my energy into my job or Julie. As a result, I don't have any close friends. Is there any way you can help solve this problem? I'm not sure. There's a part of me that feels like I'm going to look weak if I take her back after the way she treated me. Besides, after our conversation I realized how unbalanced my marriage was. I'm a little embarrassed to admit this to you. Without saying a word, we both agreed to change the subject and talk about something more neutral. Our evening was truly amazing. Sensing her uncertainty, I kindly advised her to think carefully about her decision before contacting me. I assured her that I would respect her choice, even if it meant she would never hear from me again. The next day, while walking through the supermarket, I suddenly found that I bumped into someone from a nearby coffee shop. Startled, I looked around and, to my surprise, noticed Julie, Frida, and the mysterious girl sitting facing me. Curious. I walked closer to their table, and my heart sank as soon as I realized it was Deborah. She inadvertently betrayed her recognition by saying my name. But the expected phone call came only at 9.30 p.m., when I was already on the verge of sleep, a state in which no one feels rested. Isn't it clear that I advised you not to spy on me? The fact that you did this just shows your distrust of me. Moreover, it shows a complete disregard for respect. Julie, try to look at things from my point of view. When you did this trick and refused to explain its meaning, didn't you expect me to try to get to the truth myself? This was a blatant violation of our agreed rules, Dave. Your rules, Julie. Dave, my love, I'm at a loss how to interpret all this. This judicial separation is not going the way I expected. I'm not sure how much I love you. Perhaps we should extend our relationship for another month or two to observe the result. This statement hung in the air, waiting for my violent reaction. But I chose to remain silent. Unless her feelings had changed since last Friday, it was just an aggravation to encourage me to put in more effort. There's an old saying, isn't there? If you don't succeed at first, keep trying hard. Personally, I am more impressed with the miner's version of this phrase. If it didn't work out the first time, 
Consider using more powerful explosives in the next attempt. I was disappointed and discouraged that our separation was dragging on, only reinforcing her negative opinion of me. At the same time, I recognized that deeper factors lay at the heart of the situation. Reluctantly, I admitted to myself that it was necessary to deal with the situation fairly. In an attempt to regain my former affection for her, she suggested the idea of dating other men. She expected a violent reaction from me, but my response was not deliberate silence. Rather, I was speechless and could not find the right words. Eventually, when I regained my composure, I decided to remain silent, knowing full well that I had no control over the words that would come out of my mouth, but I was sure that talking would not help solve all the problems. Dave, are you present? Despite the question, I remained silent. For a moment I wondered if I should reveal my intentions to her. Although this might have prompted her to return, it would not have solved the main problem. Julie, I firmly believe that dating you would be a pernicious choice, and I want to make that clear. Julie, I have to express my concerns about our marriage. If you go on dates or show inappropriate behavior as a married woman, I will take it as a sign of rejection of our relationship. I will explain that inappropriate behavior includes repeated meetings with a man, intimate dancing, physical contact or kissing with someone else. I hope I've made myself clear. I must admit that I'm not sure our marriage can be saved even if you come back tonight. But I'm ready to make an effort and try. I urge you to return to where you rightfully belong, Julie. This time the silence was hers. Dave. I don't think you have the right to impose your terms on me. You can't control me or claim ownership of me. I consider myself entitled to seek affection and companionship, which I have been missing for the last month. To be honest, I began to doubt Julie's sanity. It seems quite obvious that she avoided romance, and that's why she missed it. So, Julie, are you determined to have an open marriage? Let me remind you that you still haven't given a clear explanation why we should break up. The best explanation I could come up with is that you want me to put more effort and work more on our marriage. But I found the idea too disrespectful to even consider it. The advantage of your absence is that it gives me the opportunity to reflect and reflect. It became clear to me that I put a lot more effort into our relationship than you do. And again there was silence. But this time when she spoke, her voice was shaking with barely suppressed tears. She seemed to be obediently following a strategy that she suddenly realized was deeply flawed. Unfortunately, Dave, my decision has already been made. The sound of the buzzer marked the end of our conversation, and I was afraid that it also meant the death of our marriage. On Thursday evening, Sarah contacted me, she assured me of her full forgiveness, and the weight that fell off my shoulders was indescribable. As a friend, she asked about the latest news, in particular about my recent exchange with Julia. What are your next steps, Dave? Will you just sit back and let her ruin your marriage? Maybe I should spy on her this weekend, Dave. No, you shouldn't resort to such tactics, Sarah. Instead, find out where they will be and invite me there too. No, I won't stoop to her level, but it's a smart suggestion. I'd like to spend this weekend with you. After some negotiations, we agreed to have a picnic on Sunday without any problems. Without asking me about my absence on Friday or Saturday, she seemed to already know the reason. Our conversation probably lasted about two hours. It didn't take long to find Julie and Frida on Friday. The sight of them sitting in a familiar bar made me consider two possibilities. Either Julie genuinely believed that I was too fearful to keep an eye on her, or more likely, she was counting on me to do it. This time I watched the whole scene through the windows, feeling a touch of shame for my actions. Julia showed exemplary behavior throughout the evening, accompanied by Frida and Deborah. The trio talked until 10 p.m., during which Frida graciously accepted numerous dance invitations, while the other two declined. Then two determined gentlemen approached them, who clearly showed interest in Julia and Frida. In the end, Deborah left, leaving a group of four people at the table. 
Throughout the evening, the girls discreetly examined the dimly lit corners of the bar. To my delight, Frida and Julia left together, alone, at 11.30 p.m. I followed the taxi to their house and watched from afar until the lights went out. On Saturday, however, everything unfolded in a completely different way. It was a familiar bar again, where identical couples were looking forward to each other and quickly connected. The fateful moment came at exactly 8.05 p.m., when my marriage came to its bitter end. After Frida appeared in the background, she gracefully joined her chosen one on the dance floor, and another man took advantage of the opportunity. As I approached Julie, I saw him boldly put his hand on her leg. She searched the bar several times, her gaze darting around at least six times. When I entered the bar, her eyes met mine, and she made an effort to push the guy's hand away. With a smug expression on her face, she confidently uttered her first line. Dave, I specifically asked you to stop spying on me. The poor guy sitting next to her, sensing the tension in the air, quickly stood up, not knowing whether to confront me or quickly escape. Ignoring all social norms, I boldly approached him, standing close to him to emphasize the significant difference in size between us. My height is 1 meter 85. I let out a low growl before uttering the shortest sentence in English. Go away, I said quickly. Without taking my eyes off Julie's expression, I sat down in the chair I had left earlier and took a sheaf of papers out of my breast pocket. This bundle contained the documents for our amicably agreed divorce. I have already filled out all the necessary forms, only your signature remains. In addition, I have attached a separate agreement on the fair division of our property. Considering that you've already moved in, it seems logical to me to keep the house and divide everything else equally. I watched her face change from complacency to almost complete horror. Without waiting for the performance to end, I fervently wished that Julie would not notice my watery eyes. She was silent as I hurriedly retreated. Intrigued, I looked out the window again. Julie's tears flowed uncontrollably. Emotions overwhelmed her. Two minutes passed, and Frida returned with a puzzled expression on her face. As soon as her gaze fell on the papers on the table, a wide smile spread across her face. The next hour passed in a flurry of activity. Frida dominated the conversation, and I watched in silence. After 15 minutes, Julia's tears subsided, and an hour later she looked visibly calmed down. Frida seemed to have successfully convinced Julia that their idea was a success. That night I couldn't sleep. I was haunted by thoughts of the upcoming final fight, which would inevitably bring new suffering to the woman who occupied all my thoughts. Anticipating Frida's visit the next day, I decided to pretend to be absent when she appeared and ignored numerous phone calls from her. Julie was silent, leaving me out of touch with her. In search of solace, I decided to visit Sarah at exactly 1.30 in the afternoon. Barely glancing at the bright bouquet of red roses clutched in my hand, Sarah wrapped me in a warm, tight hug. It was obvious that she had an amazing ability to capture emotions. She understood that close friends do not usually exchange roses, and that I decided to present them to her when their importance had almost decreased. Inviting me inside, Sarah led me to an elderly woman. Hugging me, Sarah introduced us affectionately. Dave, meet my mom, Laura. Mom, meet my boyfriend, Dave. She introduced me, experiencing a mixture of emotions. This time, however, it was a pleasant surprise that left me speechless for a moment. I couldn't help but wonder how much information Sarah shared with her mother. Fortunately, Laura came to my rescue by asking me a question. Well, is it over? I told her about the latest developments and my assumption that Julia hadn't taken them seriously. Nevertheless, it took some effort to convince them of the seriousness of my intentions. I had to break the rules to show how little Julia respects me. Both Laura and Sarah witnessed my pain, and Laura even hugged me comfortingly. When Hannah woke up, a gentle angel entered the room. I was introduced to Hannah, but her expression turned disappointed when Sarah explained that we were going for a walk, despite Laura's attempts to convince her of how much fun she and Hannah would have together. 
I asked Sarah if Hannah could join us. Sarah hesitated for a moment, wondering if this was possible. In the end, she agreed, mentioning that she had already packed all her things in a bag. I felt relieved and inspired at the thought of spending the whole weekend with Hannah, because it was hard for me to be away from her for a whole week. Hannah's face lit up immediately when she heard the news, and a new joy reigned in the room. We spent a wonderful day by the river. Although Sarah mentioned that she felt a little alienated, her wide smile assured me that this was not a serious problem. I safely escorted both ladies home, and Laura kindly treated me to a delicious dinner. Before leaving, I said goodbye to Sarah, kissing her gently and innocently on the cheek. When I arrived at my house, I noticed that Julie was hiding in her usual hiding place a short distance away. Without even opening the front door, she quickly parked the car in the driveway and, getting out, left the engine running. Clutching the papers I handed her on Saturday, she stood in front of me. Here you go, Dave, she said, her voice sounding confident. Signed and witnessed. Good night. I was stunned as I watched her walk back to her car. She quickly got into the car and fastened her seatbelt. Putting the car in reverse, she rolled down the window and turned to me. Now that I've solved your little charade, maybe you'll have the courage to ask me out this week. Wednesday suits me. With these words hanging in the air, she gracefully walked away. Although the saying goes, men are from Mars, women are from Venus, I often find myself tied to reality on Earth. Julie seems to originate from the Horsehead Nebula, which gives her an otherworldly aura. If her emotions were manifested by ear, they would resemble a creepy and disturbing scream. The unexplained phenomenon of the scream began on Monday evening, enveloping the neighborhood with its disturbing presence. After returning home from work, Frida was looking forward to my appearance at the house. Without warning, she grabbed me and kissed me hard on the lips when I got out of the car. Scared, I quickly pushed her away, raising my voice to declare my feelings once and for all. Listen, Frida, I want to make it clear that I'm not interested in you at all. Any response she made was drowned out by the deafening roar of the engine. Julie's sudden appearance startled Frida, and the screeching tires added to the chaos. Noticing Julie's approach, Frida hurriedly ran down the driveway hoping to elude her. She almost managed to escape, but as soon as Julie's car stopped, she forcefully opened the door, accidentally hitting Frida and knocking her to the ground. Frida quickly got to her feet, but an angry blow to the head sent her rolling on the ground again. This time, Frida had no desire to get to her feet quickly. As a rule, in such circumstances, it is better to stay put. In an amazing fight, the enraged tigress confronted Julie, realizing that she had been tricked. Julie was kicking her legs furiously, overcome with indescribable rage. Exhausted but still seething, I courageously intervened, gently forcing her to the ground. Suddenly, a police car drove by, which led to our subsequent arrest and urgent medical care for Frida. Julie was being interrogated by the authorities, and her high-pitched screams echoed in my cell. Eventually they gave up and escorted her to a nearby cell to cool off. When it was my turn, I told them everything that had happened, trying to convince them that Julie's actions were justified. I thought it was my duty to protect her. At 11 p.m., I was released with apologies. The following Monday, I returned to my work. On the way home, I contacted Sarah on the phone, she kindly invited me to dinner and conveyed Hannah's request. Could this good-natured Dave read me a bedtime story tonight? An hour later than my usual time, I finally got home. I was collaborating with Frida's father when I decided to visit him and his wife at their home. My goal was to share with them all the information I have about their daughter's manipulative behavior towards my wife. To my surprise, None of them showed much surprise when they heard my revelations. I still managed to convince them to step in and dissuade Frida from accusing Julia of assault. They assured me that they would do their best to accomplish this task. When I got home, I noticed Julia's car parked in the garage. A sense of curiosity led me to the bedroom, where I found her suitcases lying empty on the bed. 
Judging by the sound of running water, she was taking a shower. I called Sarah and told her that I had to cancel our dinner plans. During our conversation, we discussed strategies that Julie could use. Looking back, we realized that we were both wrong. Julie came down the stairs, exuding her usual self-confidence. After inquiring about our dinner menu, she asked, What's for dinner, Dave? I didn't say a word, which prompted her to come over to me and sit right in front of my chair. Dave, I've made the decision to forgive you, she said. We both acted stupidly, but let's get through this and start all over again. I'm here. Overwhelmed with emotions, I could no longer restrain myself and impulsively poured out my thoughts. Julia, could you give me a detailed account of my stupid behavior and the actions I took to earn your forgiveness? I was very hurt and hurt when you initiated the divorce, Dave, but I knew about your insincerity throughout the whole process. What made you believe it was just a bluff, Julia? Frida mentioned it. All the illusions Julia had harbored by this point seemed to have completely disappeared. She had been under Frida's influence for so long that traces of this influence have survived to this day. Under the weight of the new reality, her face turned ashen, and she collapsed onto the coffee table with a crash. The minutes ticked by, stretching the performance to an excruciatingly long five or six. Eventually, the truth dawned on her, and she said, So that's it, right? You weren't bluffing about the divorce. I was so sure that I even signed the papers. With a heavy heart, I shook my head mournfully. Just know, Julie, we didn't break up. You pushed me away. I've always given my best, done everything in my power and capabilities for you. But what did I get in return? You abandoned me, leaving me confused and alone. I tried to warn you, didn't I say that it was fraught? How much clearer could I be? Given the tremendous love and dedication that I have invested, I expected, no, I believed that I deserved at least respect and dedication. Did I get them? No. Instead, I was treated with disdain, left broken and discouraged. Have you ever thought about the unfair distribution of efforts in our marriage that I've witnessed over the past five weeks? No. You allowed yourself to be influenced by a manipulator who convinced you that you deserve more. Unfortunately, as a result, you can no longer get Frida. I don't understand where all this came from. Let's focus on the fact that Frida has nothing to do with our situation. Although over time I realized that she was using deception to separate us, I never saw her as anything other than a lying person. So Dave, everything is fine between us, right? It was at this moment that everything changed irreversibly. No, Julie, we're not okay. The divorce papers have been signed and mean the official end of our relationship. But it's incredibly hard for me to forget that you've been disrespectful to me all the time. The threats only increase the pain. I must admit, when you left me, I was lucky enough to find solace elsewhere. Surprisingly, Julia's face turned even paler when she heard this. Perplexed, she asked, What do you mean, Dave? I confess, Julia, that I have found another woman in my life. At first, she was just a supportive friend who helped me cope with difficulties. Truly, I needed her during those difficult times. You left me, and unfortunately, Julie, you took a risk that didn't pay off. With a clear conscience, I boldly entered a new chapter of my life. When I told Julie that I was in love with her friend Sarah, Julie raised a big scandal. I've never heard her swear so much at me. It was disgusting of her. But she was already indifferent to me. What I wanted was to meet Sarah and her beautiful daughter as soon as possible. Two years have passed since that moment, and Sarah and I are happily married and expecting the birth of our son together. And Judy continues to communicate with her manipulative friend and lead a dissolute lifestyle. Gentlemen, you have a great story ahead of you. This story would make a great script for a Quentin Tarantino movie. Everything you're about to hear is completely made up and never happened in reality. But maybe some of you will learn some valuable lessons. Justine Waters immediately answered the call after recognizing a message from her husband Tom, who had been on a business trip for the past few days. Anxiously, she unlocked her phone and read the message that appeared on the screen. It simply said, 
Business is finished here. I'm on my way back. Remember that dinner is booked for 7 o'clock in the evening at Mario's restaurant. I'll see you there. Happy anniversary. Justine couldn't help but notice the absence of any words of love or affection or even a heart emoji. However, she wasn't particularly surprised. It seems that for some unknown reason their relationship lacked such sentimental gestures. Tom has been withdrawn lately. Justine responded to his lack of communication with a message in which she said goodbye to him and expressed her love, hoping that the answer would bring her comfort. She anxiously put the phone on the bedside table, waiting for at least some kind of answer that would dispel her fears. But there was no response. Justine glanced at her watch and noticed that she still had plenty of time to freshen up before meeting her husband. She sighed, got out of bed, and headed to the bathroom to take a shower before meeting her husband. While she was preparing, a thought occurred to her. Who is the person she was talking to? Jake Carter. Who was that? The man she had spent several hours with asked. It was my husband, Justine replied. He informed me that he was coming back. Moreover, he has already booked a table for us at Mario's restaurant for the evening. This is our fifth anniversary. Oh, it's your fifth anniversary, Jake remarked. But I thought you mentioned that he went east. Yes, he was there, Justine confirmed. Apparently, he managed to complete everything ahead of schedule. I have to call my mom and ask if she can keep an eye on baby Jacob for a little longer. Okay, then go back to bed, Jake suggested. Jake smiled slyly. Maybe we can surprise Tom with a little gift. Justine couldn't resist snorting at his suggestion. I'd love to, Jake, but I need to get myself cleaned up. Time is not on my side, she replied. Fortunately, I have spare clothes here that I can put on. It's not worth it for me to meet my husband while I'm still in these rumpled and stained things. Do you think he suspects that there is something between us? Justine shook her head and confidently stated, No, I don't think so. He's been busy with other things lately. He is completely absorbed in his work, leaving no room for anything else. Our conversations have become rare, and he barely communicates with our child. It's like he lives in a separate reality. Jake asked how long he would be in their lives. Justine answered dispassionately, not knowing what to say. She acknowledged his ability to provide, but also suggested that he could become a father if he wanted to. I wondered if he knew that baby Jacob didn't biologically belong to him, but if he did, he preferred to keep quiet about it. I find it hard to believe that he could have allowed something like this to happen without informing me. Anyway, I'll be here if you need help. Justine smiled at him, glancing briefly at his relaxed lower body, which was now located on his right leg. Could you warm it up for me? She offered playfully, grinning mischievously. Of course, baby, he replied, smiling back. Justine went to her closet and took out a fresh dress. Justine was amazed that in this closet, and not in the one she shared with her husband, the vast majority of her belongings are stored. She examined the chosen dress, trying to remember if Tom had seen it before. The blue dress, ending about three inches above the knee, had a seductive neckline. Justine was pretty sure that Tom had already seen this dress, but if not, then she would just say that she had recently bought it. After calling her mother, Justine retired to the bathroom and took a relaxing steam shower. After finishing the shower, Justine carefully combed her luxurious ebony locks until they lay perfectly. Thoughtfully dressed, she expertly applied makeup to accentuate her features. After making sure that she exuded a seductive fragrance and her appearance met Tom's standards, she said goodbye to Jake with a gentle kiss. Will I see you at the office tomorrow? What is it? He asked, looking her up and down. Of course, my beloved, but today duty calls, she replied, picked up her purse and gracefully left the room. In the parking lot across from the Mario restaurant, Tom Waters sat in his Escalade and puffed on a cigarette. A message had just arrived from one of his private detectives informing him that Justine had finally left Jake Carter's luxury condo. She had been Jake's lover for almost a year and a half. Tom looked curiously at the photo of Justine in a stunning blue dress that the investigator had recently sent. 
He had never seen her in such a dress, which did not surprise him at all. Justine was not mistaken. Tom did go east, but unexpectedly returned a day earlier than expected. He received a clear and urgent message about a serious security breach requiring immediate intervention. The message warned that if he failed to handle the situation, a mysterious federal agency, unknown to the public, would intervene. Remembering the excitement that had gripped him, Tom clearly remembered sitting in the office of a man with an unusual look, who bore only one name, Alpha One. Tom was not one of those privileged people who knew the man's name. The movement of the man's head reminded Tom of the actor who portrayed Moses. Waters, you have a serious problem, the man warned. And when you have a problem, it becomes everyone's problem. Solve it in silence, or I'll solve it for you. Tom realized that answering with a respectful, yes, sir, was the only answer Alpha One would consider acceptable, and demonstrated his intelligence. Besides, he was well aware of Alpha One's ruthless nature when it came to eliminating people. He heard stories about the infamous act of the Alpha, who destroyed an entire estate on the beach, along with its inhabitants. Just the thought of it sent an icy shiver down Tom's spine. Justine, who perceived Tom solely as a well-known traveling salesman who travels around the country and sells his products to companies wishing to purchase enhanced security systems, did not suspect his true identity. She didn't know that Tom's role went far beyond selling and overseeing the installation of security equipment. But he wasn't just a salesman. He had a much more important role to play. The products he sold and expertly installed contained unique circuits that allowed Alpha One monitors to gain an unprecedented insight into the internal structure of these enterprises. They provided information about their clientele, financial profits, and all the smallest details. Tom was well aware that the problem Alpha was talking about concerned his wife, Justine, to whom he had been married for five years, at least until today. Over the past year and a half, their relationship has been ruined by Justine's passionate affair with Jake Carter. Tom, a paralegal at a law firm, recently learned that one of the senior partners, Justine, is having an affair. Since Tom often traveled for work, he did not know all the details until recently, although he had noticed the strained relationship between them for some time. Tom eventually found out about the affair when Justine announced that she was pregnant. After seeking legal help, Tom talked to a lawyer, who informed him that divorce was not possible in their state while Justine was pregnant. This meant that if the child turned out to be his, then Tom would be required to pay alimony. Regardless of the prenuptial agreement they both signed, Tom felt relieved knowing that he wouldn't have to worry about the house he owned before marriage. Despite his growing frustration, Tom gritted his teeth and remained silent throughout the pregnancy. But he almost lost his temper when she decided to name their newborn Jacob after her lover. Unable to contain his curiosity, Tom took a DNA test immediately after giving birth. The results confirmed what he had suspected from the beginning. The child was not his own. Looking at his watch, Tom realized that Justine, whom he had been waiting for, would be arriving soon. Looking in the direction of Mario, he noticed a man in a khaki jacket and a woman with a briefcase. Instantly, he realized that they had come for him. Quickly moving the car to the other side of the street, he found a parking spot. Carrying his briefcase, he headed for the entrance, greeting the two people at the door with a slight nod. Entering into a quiet conversation with the woman, Tom quickly took a seat in a secluded corner booth. In the next booth, close enough to eavesdrop, sat a couple in khaki clothes. Thanking the waitress for a glass of water, Tom concentrated on studying the menu. When Justine sat down opposite him, he immediately noticed her presence and put the menu aside. Standing up, he greeted her in a neutral tone. Good evening, Justine. You look very good today. She replied with a smile, thanking him. Thank you, Tom. Is this something new? Pointing to the dress. Confirming her remark, she replied with a slight smile, Yes, I just bought it. Do you like it? He gave her another compliment. Yes, it really highlights your eyes. 
When Justine sat down opposite him, he immediately noticed her presence and put the menu aside. Standing up he greeted her in a neutral tone. Good evening Justine, you look very good today. She replied with a smile thanking him. Thank you Tom. Is this something new? Pointing to the dress. Confirming her remark she replied with a slight smile. Yes, I just bought it. Do you like it? He gave her another compliment. Yes, it really highlights your eyes. Tom gently took her hand and led her to the center of the dance floor. They rocked gracefully in each other's arms, but Justine couldn't shake the subtle sense of distance that Tom maintained between them, as if their bond was fragile and tender. When the song came to an end, Tom politely escorted her back to the booth, where plates of food were waiting for them. Justine couldn't suppress her anxiety anymore and asked, Is something wrong, Tom? You're kind of distant today, especially on our anniversary. Tom thought for a moment, and there was a note of indecision in his voice. Yes, today is our anniversary, he admitted, but I need to share something with someone. Justine was stunned by Tom's comment about her dress, which hinted that it had a persistent smell reminiscent of Jake Carter's closet. Despite her best efforts, she couldn't completely get rid of this association. Offended by Tom's words, she asked, What do you mean by Jack Carter? Are you serious? Desperately trying to steer the conversation in a different direction, Justine tried in vain to distract Tom. Tom replied dispassionately, as if not noticing the tension, Yes, I mean Jake Carter, one of the senior partners of the law firm where you work. Of course I know him? Justine replied sarcastically. I really hope so, Tom replied, considering that you spent a lot of time in his bed, and don't forget that he is the father of little Jacob. Justine's face turned red with anger. What are you implying? This is simply outrageous! I refuse to sit here and let you talk to me like that, she said indignantly. Tom, in turn, calmly opened his briefcase. Actually, please sit down, he said sternly. You will listen and absorb any information I choose to share, especially considering your actions over the past 16 months. Justine's eyes widened in confusion. What do you mean? I don't understand what you're talking about, she said, puzzled by his words. In response, he placed a piece of paper on the table in front of her. Take a look at this, he asked, pointing to the document. Curious, she studied him and asked, what is it? He remained calm and replied, these are the results of a DNA test conducted on our child. According to him, Jacob is not my biological son. Moreover, a second DNA test confirms that your lover, Jake Carter, is indeed the sperm donor of Jacob, the child you named after him. Stunned by this discovery, she tried to understand. But how could you get Jake's DNA? What is it? She asked with obvious confusion. Without hesitation, he explained, it's very simple. You brought it home with you at least three nights every week. But it didn't end there. He handed over a heavy folder and casually placed it on the surface of the table. What's in there? This is a compilation of all the emails, text messages, and online conversations that you have exchanged with Jake over the past 16 months. Unfortunately, I have to inform you that the concept of privacy on the internet practically does not exist. Okay. I'll admit it, she admitted. Jake and I committed one careless act, but that was all. It was purely physical and had no emotional significance. Is that so? Find page 75 and scroll down until you reach the highlighted passage. Explain exactly what you noticed. She flipped through the pages until she came to the very page Tom was talking about. When she read her own words, her complexion turned ashen. I'm waiting, he demanded. Read it out loud. I want to hear exactly the words you wrote to him. She answered in a barely audible voice. I'm reading, simply, I don't want to say them out loud. She took a deep breath and looked at the page again. Please, she begged, don't force me to do this. Either you do it or... Tears streamed down her face. She took another look at the paper, focusing on the words that Tom had marked. Jake... I'm fascinated by the way you took me. These 16 months have brought me incomparable satisfaction. 
I look forward to the joy of conceiving another child from you. In all the time we've been married I can't remember a single time you've spoken to me like that, Tom asked, hoping for something more than what she'd just read. Is that really all? She asked nervously. Do I feel self-loathing? I have a lot of visual, audio, and video evidence for hours on end. He emphatically confirmed. Yes, I certainly feel it. She looked up, startled by his words. She felt as if she had been hit in the face. Memories flooded back to her, reminding her of those moments when he was ready to risk his life for her. Curiosity got the better of her, and she asked, How long have you known? Even before you admitted that you were pregnant, I had my suspicions. I've done my own investigation and gathered some evidence. In order to fulfill the requirements of the prenuptial agreement, I realized that I needed to consult with a lawyer. Unfortunately, by the time I sought legal help, you had already informed me of your pregnancy. The lawyer made it clear to me that no court would consider the idea of divorce before the birth of a child, including alimony and related issues. But now that Jacob has been born, I have sufficient evidence to carry out my intentions. As a result, I initiated divorce proceedings based on adultery. Tom gestured at two people sitting nearby who then came over to our table. This kind gentleman has something to offer you. Miss Justine Waters? The man asked. Yes, Justine replied softly. With a gentle gesture, the man handed her a heavy envelope made of thick paper and placed it in front of her. You have been served, he announced. Justine asked in disbelief, and tears flowed down her cheeks. Served? Tom confirmed it by handing her a pen. The divorce papers, study them. They exactly repeat the terms that we agreed on in the prenuptial agreement. If you sign now, I am ready to offer you a bank check for $2,145.63, exactly the amount that you possessed when we got married. Please refrain from other requests. I already know about the existence of your stash of money. You can keep it for yourself. All your belongings have been moved to your mother's residence. It is important to note that she is fully informed and extremely distressed by your actions. Despite this, she has agreed to provide you with shelter until you find a place to live. But I have to clarify that this agreement is primarily for the sake of our child, not for your sake. Justine expressed a desire to avoid a divorce. Let me share something with you. Taking out his phone, he replayed the conversation she had with Jake earlier in the day. Her eyes widened in surprise when she heard her own voice coming from Tom's device. How? How did you get this? What is it? She asked with obvious confusion. Tom replied with a smile that had no trace of warmth in it. I could have told you, but then I would have had to eliminate you without hesitation. Despite my current contempt for you, I don't think it's right to deprive little Jacob of his mother. He paused for a moment before continuing. To you, I was just a financial assistant and a guardian nothing more. While the father of your child enjoyed all the benefits, it is important for you to know that your privileges have been revoked. There won't be any more free lunches for you, at least not from me. Fortunately, we live in a state where prosecution for causing emotional distance is allowed. He is currently being handed the necessary documents. The result may or may not be significant, but the principle is important, isn't it? Anyway, his problems are just beginning. You see, today I had a conversation with Hamilton Parker, your managing partner. I presented my evidence to him, expressing dissatisfaction, knowing full well that one of his senior assistants had entered into a relationship with my wife, who turned out to be his subordinate, at least for the moment. Mr. Parker looked extremely upset and was very worried about the possible consequences of Mr. Carter's actions for his company not to mention the significant financial consequences. He agreed that it would be beneficial for Mr. Carter to sever ties with the company, and assured me that he would discuss the matter with the board of directors this evening. In addition, he agreed that it would be unfair to impose any punishment on you, especially considering your status as a mother with a newborn child. Given that Mr. Carter is your boss, so to speak, 
he didn't want to put the company at risk of facing a sexual harassment lawsuit. Given your track record at the company, he thought it was in everyone's best interest to keep your job, at least temporarily. But I want to assure you, Tom added, that Mr. Carter's problems are just beginning. How well do you know your lover? I mean, do you really know him? What do you mean? Justine asked. I'm discussing his clientele, he replied. I wonder who he really represents and what he does when he's not hiding you. Have you come across any information about this? Justine admitted. I don't know anything about these issues. He never discusses them with me. Tom noticed. Maybe it's for the best. I'll say this. Jake Carter has a rather intriguing group of clients that is of interest to certain government organizations. These organizations have the ability to completely erase a person without leaving any trace. Do you understand what I mean? What is it? He asked, looking at her with a scared expression on his face. Tom, you're scaring me. You should be scared, he warned her. Are you scared enough to distance yourself from Jake Carter? Because he's going to have terrible consequences. And if you're with him when that happens, you'll suffer the same fate. Who are you, Tom? She asked. Seriously? He grinned, gesturing at the documents spread out in front of her. Justin, sign the papers and put an end to this farce. Maybe I've already revealed too much to you. Also, I wanted to inform you that your credit card has been terminated, and the house key is no longer valid. Today, while you were with Jake, I took the initiative to replace the locks. In addition, I have settled the situation with the bank account, making sure that you no longer have access to it. However, considering that you diligently save half of your earnings to a private secret account, this should not pose a particular problem for you. You were aware of everything, weren't you? She asked. Tom shrugged his shoulders, unperturbed. Stunned, Justine examined the divorce papers and found that they exactly matched the information provided by Tom. After signing the papers, she returned the pen to Tom, who smiled back. Picking up a pen, he studied the documents carefully. The procedural server checked their signatures, and the woman accompanying him notarized the signed papers. Then Tom returned the completed papers to the man and assured, I'll make sure they get to your lawyer, Mr. Waters. Tom thanked him gratefully. When they were gone, Tom turned his attention to Justine. I think it's time for you to get your rings back, he advised her. Do I really have to do this? What is it? She asked, sounding disappointed. Rings had always held a special place in her heart, but obviously not enough to resist the temptation of Jake Carter. With tears cascading down her cheeks, Justine regretfully took off her favorite rings and carefully placed them on the table. He quickly grabbed them and put the jewelry in his pocket, and then turned his attention back to her. Our business is over, he announced. Is that really your last word? Is that all you have to offer? She asked, looking for answers. What else can I say? He replied, seemingly indifferently. Tell me why. Why did you choose our anniversary for this? She begged, and her voice trembled, and the tears continued to flow. Do you have any idea how humiliated I felt at that moment? Can you even begin to imagine how deeply humiliating it was for me to find out that you had been cheating on me all this time? It is impossible to imagine how much shame I felt when I found out that Jacob was not my biological son. And to top it all off, I was extremely humiliated to find out that you cheated on me with Carter on our anniversary. Spare me your excuses, Tom announced. It's over. Goodbye, Justin. I never want to catch your eye again. With these last words, he returned to his meal, deliberately avoiding looking at Justine, who was wiping away tears. The waitress came up to their table and asked if they were happy. Is everything okay? What is it? She asked. Tom replied casually. Yes, the food is consistently excellent. Then he added, I'll pay, and my companion will take the food with her, please. The waitress nodded, confirming his request, and quickly went to get a container of food for Justine. After a while, she reappeared, putting the rest of Justine's food in a styrofoam box. Meanwhile, 
Tom held out his credit card to pay the bill, and Justine packed her things. When the waitress finished, Justine turned her attention to Tom. Is that all? What is it? She asked with a note of disappointment in her voice. Tom waved his hand casually, answering, That's it. The way he brushed her off left Justine perplexed. Trying to save the situation, she apologized, and Tom looked up from his plate before answering, At least we can come to an agreement. In conclusion, he said goodbye. And now have a good day. Say hi to your mom. Oh, and happy anniversary, he added with a faint smile. Justine was stunned by the impassive gesture of her husband, who discarded her as unnecessary garbage. Overwhelmed with grief, she hurriedly ran out from behind the table, tears streaming down her face. Meanwhile, Tom calmly continued his meal, seemingly paying no attention to anything. Noticing the disapproving glances of his fellow diners, he responded to their disparaging glances with a casual smile and an indifferent shrug of his shoulders. Although outwardly Tom looked calm, inwardly he felt completely broken. The breakup of their five-year relationship left him emotionally shattered. Still, he found solace in the thought that the worst was over. Tom successfully spent the following days without any major disruptions, but it was far from easy. He had once had a genuine affection for Justine, and it was painful for him to take a different approach to her. But he made a conscious decision not to give in to impulsive reactions, realizing that it was more prudent than giving in to his desires. And then one fateful day, there was a gentle knock on his front door. Sitting in the bedroom on the top floor, Tom looked through the window and noticed Carter's luxury sports car parked in the driveway. A nagging intuition told me that such a meeting was inevitable. At the insistence of Alpha One, he decided to improve the security system of his house. When he came down the stairs and unlocked the door, he was met by an angry Jake Carter. Tom instinctively stepped back as Carter stormed into the house. Burning with anger, Carter accused Tom of ruining his career and forcing Justin to ignore him. In a fit of anger, Jake threatened to kill him using obscene language. Suddenly, Tom noticed that 15 tiny red dots appeared on Carter's shirt, indicating an approaching emergency or storm. Don't move! An electronic voice shouted from the speakers on the wall. Startled, the uninvited guest screamed, What the hell is going on? Panic gripped him, and he instinctively raised his hands, trying to figure out the situation. A moment later, a piercing sound like an air rifle shot pierced the air. Jake's gaze moved downwards, revealing a shocking sight. A multitude of 15 darts sticking out of his trembling body. Desperately trying to fight back, he reached up, but his strength failed him. His eyes rolled back, and he collapsed lifelessly to the floor. The voice said mockingly, I'm afraid your plans to take your life today, Carter, have been thwarted. Calming down, Tom took out his phone and pressed the icon, instantly connecting to the male voice. Operator 7, we need help in aisle 15, Tom said. Understood, cleaning in aisle 15, the man confirmed. With another push of a button on his phone, Tom deactivated the hidden systems that had recently sent tranquilizer darts at Jake. As the system smoothly retracted into the ceiling, the closed doors hid all traces of their presence. Tom chuckled as he watched the flawless operation of the newly installed security system. A few moments later, an inconspicuous white van smoothly pulled into the driveway. A group of men dressed in Tyvek suits sneaked into the house and carefully carried Jake's lifeless figure out of it. One of the intruders quickly took possession of Jake's keys, easily slipping into the driver's seat of his expensive sports car. In a matter of minutes, both the van and the stolen sports car disappeared into thin air. Tom calmly closed the door behind him and went back to his daily routine. A few days later, after stopping by a nearby coffee shop to drink a delicious caramel mocha, Tom continued to go about his business. A large man in a dark suit and sunglasses intercepted him as he walked down the street. Mr. Waters, Alpha One wants to talk to you, the man said hoarsely, right now. Feeling a little disappointed by the man's behavior, Tom replied, Good. 
He followed the man until they reached a black limousine parked on the side of the road. As soon as the man opened the back door, Tom climbed in. As soon as the door slammed shut, Alpha One greeted him. Waters, glad to see you're free again. Tom respectfully replied. Thank you, sir. I have a lot to do. Alpha One put his hand on Tom's shoulder with a friendly smile, calming him down. You're welcome, Tom, he said warmly. The one-eyed man known as Regis leaned closer. When it's just the two of us, feel free to call me Regis, he suggested. I would like to tell you about Mr. Carter. He has become very talkative and sings like a canary, Regis said. Tom, grateful for the information, turned to Regis as an alpha. So he's saying it right? Yes, Regis confirmed. He started off strong and now he's literally singing like a canary. It seems that the strategic use of tranquilizer darts in the latest security system, as well as the use of serum to obtain the necessary information, greatly weakened his mental abilities. He is currently engaged in a childish activity, rocking back and forth in a metal case and making bird-like sounds at the same time. Tom informed Regis that this man, with whom we were trying to resolve the issue out of court, fortunately reached an agreement before his cognitive abilities deteriorated so much that he could not sign his own name. Regis went on to say that the man, overwhelmed with gratitude for saving his life, agreed to conditions beyond your initial desires. That's good to hear, Tom said, accepting Regis's compliment on the new system. I'm glad that we did not take advantage of my offer to use 50 caliber chain pistols after we received everything we needed from Carter, he added. I feel the same way, Tom continued, mentioning that he had recently cleaned his carpet. Regis smiled back. Changing the subject, Tom asked about Justine, wondering if there was any news. She's back at work, Regis said, but Mr. Parker is strictly controlling her actions. Have you ever revealed to her the true identity of your employer? Regis asked. No, Regis, I didn't, Tom replied. Regis nodded, aware of this fact thanks to his surveillance devices, but wanting to hear it directly from Tom. Okay, Regis said. Once your divorce is settled, I would appreciate it if you would visit the headquarters. I'm going to introduce you to your new employee. An employee? Tom asked again. I've never needed a partner in the past. There's a first time for everything, isn't there, Tom? Replied Regis. Yes, sir, I suppose so, Tom replied. Excellent, Regis admitted. In that case, I'm looking forward to meeting you. Likewise, Regis, Tom confirmed. The door swung open, announcing the end of the meeting. Getting out of the luxury car, Tom watched the bulky figure maneuvering in the driver's seat. As the elongated car smoothly merged into the noisy traffic, Tom reflected on the mysterious plans that Regis had in mind for him. For many years, I endured my mother's constant comments about how she would like me to find a girl as beautiful as Amanda. I'm Steve Hollis, and Amanda is my older brother Mark's wife. Although Amanda was both beautiful and came from a wealthy family, I couldn't shake the feeling that there was more to a relationship than just money. During my high school years, I enjoyed the company of a variety of friends, including both men and women. Most of us were just platonic friends. My mom hoped that eventually I would meet some of them, especially Karen. But deep down, I knew that Karen was in a completely different league, far beyond my reach. After we all graduated, I kept in touch with several former colleagues from the company. But others made new friendships, often among their colleagues. I was working as a trainee car mechanic at the time, and that's when I met Laura. Despite the fact that Laura did not like to wear makeup, her beauty seemed obvious to me. Intrigued by her, I plucked up the courage and asked her out, after which our relationship blossomed. Like many other couples, we entered into a physical relationship, and like many others, we faced an unexpected problem when Laura became pregnant. On that fateful evening, when we were having a heartfelt conversation, there was anxiety in the air. The terrible prospect of making a decision weighed on us, but in the end, we unanimously agreed that abortion was not an option. Then our worries shifted to the difficult task of telling our parents about this situation. 
Driven by a sense of responsibility, I plucked up the courage and made a marriage proposal to Lara, believing that this was the right thing to do. Although her parents expressed their disappointment about her pregnancy, her father acknowledged my commendable willingness not to abandon his daughter. My parents, on the contrary, reacted with displeasure, leaving no room for ambiguity when they expressed their displeasure. Especially striking was the reaction of my mother, who almost fainted when she learned about our upcoming wedding. We got married at the local registry office. My brother was the best man and the witness. Laura's sister was the bridesmaid and the witness. Due to lack of funds, the honeymoon did not take place, and we started looking for a place to live. My boss's brother owned a real estate rental and management firm, and we rented a small two-room apartment in a decent neighborhood. Laura and I went for an ultrasound and found out that she was expecting twins. What are we going to do? Let's wait and see. We decided to give preference to children and do our best. I devoted long hours to work so that we would have everything we needed. One evening, when we were leisurely watching TV, there was a sudden knock on the door. I carefully opened it and saw my boss Brian and his wife Linda standing there, grinning from ear to ear. We sat down, sipped our coffee and started a conversation. The topic of managing our finances arose and Brian kindly admitted, Steve, I understand that you are going through hard times due to the recent arrival of children and we would like to offer you our help. If you need help, please let us know and we will do everything. Laura was overwhelmed by emotions and she began to shed tears. Linda was sitting next to her giving comfort and support. Brian, I have no words but to express my gratitude. Don't say a word, darling. You work tirelessly and I think you deserve some help. Brian stayed true to his promise. When we made a list of necessary things, I handed it to him along with a request that everything he would purchase would be very grateful to him. We assumed that he would choose the most expensive product so that it would be easier for us to cope with the rest of the items on the list. To our surprise, Laura and I were shocked when Brian and Linda arrived a few days later with all the purchases from the list. Linda explained that they have already faced a similar situation in the past and understand how difficult it is for us. The difference between us was that Brian and Linda couldn't get pregnant, which prompted them to help us. Not so long ago, my 22-year-old brother and his girlfriend Amanda tied the knot. Amanda's parents generously covered the costs of the wedding, and the result was a magnificent celebration decorated with expensive flowers and jewelry. It turned out that Laura was feeling a touch of envy, perhaps dreaming of the same grand wedding. To my horror, my mother made a remark twice during the wedding reception, expressing her desire that I find a woman like Amanda. This remark angered me, because Laura was more than satisfactory. She worked as hard as I did, and together we devoted the remaining time to preparing for the arrival of our twins. I must admit that although Laura may not have succeeded in home economics, our house is always kept clean and tidy. On this long-awaited day, Laura welcomed the arrival of twins, a precious boy and a charming girl. After careful consideration, we decided to name them Jason and Sarah. At first, it turned out to be quite a difficult journey for both of us, especially for Laura, when I had to return to work after a short break. But I tried my best, and Laura looked after our little miracle with admiration. Often when I got home, I found all three of them peacefully dozing, which prompted me to cook dinner and gently wake Laura up. We had dinner together, discussed the days that had passed, and made sure that we both refreshed ourselves and put ourselves in proper shape before heading out for a night's rest. Our intimate life was average, without much excitement. We were often exhausted, finding solace and snuggling up in bed and falling asleep before doing anything else. But whenever we shared moments of passion, Laura invariably found pleasure in it and never expressed dissatisfaction. My parents regularly came to visit to spend time with their grandchildren. Unfortunately, my mother often complained about the condition of our apartment. Due to the lack of a dryer, our belongings were neatly laid out on the shelves near the radiators. Despite her comments, I tried not to pay attention to them. 
I was well aware of the enormous difficulties faced by Laura, who alone took care of our two young children all day. To express our gratitude, we reached out to Brian and Linda and asked them to become godparents to Jason and Sarah. Their response was filled with joy, and they wholeheartedly accepted the role. My brother informed me that Jason and Sarah would be the only grandchildren of our parents, since Amanda had decided not to have children. In the following years, Laura and I faced many difficulties until our children started going to school. Eventually Laura returned to work, and we managed to rent a house with a small garden where our children could play freely. It was a path that required patience and perseverance, but in the end, we coped with it. We have successfully organized the apartment, putting everything in its place. Although most of the furniture was second-hand, we made sure to buy a new bed for ourselves and cots for the children. Every time we came to visit, our parents greeted us with great joy. As our children grew up quickly, they became attached to our parents' extensive backyard garden. Unfortunately, Laura's mother fell ill, and her father was left alone with her. Despite our difficulties, he greatly appreciated any help we could offer during this difficult time. I felt uneasy when I noticed that every time we visited my parents, Mark was present and Amanda was absent. One day, curiosity got the better of me and I asked Mark where Amanda was. He mentioned casually that she had left for work, but my father's expression hinted that he wanted to say something, but refrained from doing so. Our meetings with Mark and Amanda were infrequent, and it seemed more like Amanda's decision than Mark's. Whenever they came, I couldn't help but feel that Amanda valued herself more than Laura. Amanda used to express her opinion that having children severely limited her abilities, emphasizing her love of freedom. Laura and I chose to ignore her remarks rather than engage in heated arguments. Shortly before the twins turned six, Mark contacted us, admitting that Amanda had gone to work and he was bored. I felt like he was hiding something from us, but I didn't know how to bring it up. A few days later I discovered the source of my brother's anxiety. When I was doing a test drive of my client's car in the driveway, I happened to drive past Amanda's place of work. To my surprise, I saw her walking out of the office holding hands with a man. They crossed the street and stopped to kiss passionately. It was undoubtedly the kind of intimate gesture that is intended exclusively for a married woman and her husband. This revelation made me wonder if I should tell my brother about what I witnessed. Laura insisted that I had a moral obligation to share this information with him. Knowing my brother's character well, I understood that if Amanda really cheated, it would mean the end of their relationship, since he would never tolerate such betrayal. I decided to ask my father for advice, hoping that he would be able to clarify whether I should keep quiet or not. Dad, I'm torn. It seems that everyone makes mistakes in life, but it is very important that we learn from them, I expressed my concerns. My father understood my dilemma and replied, I understand your concerns, Steve, but I think it would be better if we let Mark figure this out for himself, for now. If he finds out the truth, we can support him. But I don't think he'll be happy if you reveal Amanda's infidelity. Taking into account my father's advice, I eventually decided to remain silent for the time being. A few weeks later, Mark called me and asked me to help him on Friday night. Without hesitation, I agreed, and he came to pick me up at 7 p.m. curious. I asked about the essence of his request. You'll find out when we arrive, Mark replied cryptically. When we arrived at the Hilton Hotel, about 30 miles away, he parked the car and muttered something to himself hoping that his intuition was wrong. Reluctantly, I followed him as we walked to the front desk. After entering into a short conversation and presenting his driver's license, Mark asked to make the necessary arrangements. Mark received a keycard to access Amanda's room. During the elevator ride, he mentioned that he had discovered that it was not a work trip and expressed curiosity about Amanda's activities. As we approached the room, we heard a distinct noise from inside, and it became clear what was going on there. Mark carefully inserted the keycard into the door, gradually opening it. 
I quietly followed him two steps. The room was filled with the sound of Amanda's voice pleading for more intensity. Two men were holding her in the room, and Mark was standing off to the side watching what was happening with a camera. Both men were completely engrossed in their actions, oblivious to our presence. I saw Mark cautiously come closer, and then swiftly swung his leg and landed a powerful blow right in the groin of one of the men. He let out a piercing scream, quickly lost consciousness, and fell off the bed. Amanda let out a scream, quickly turned to face us, and hurriedly threw a sheet over herself to cover herself. Meanwhile, the remaining man got off the bed and began to move towards our position. Nasty people, leave immediately! Mark delivered a powerful blow to the man's face, and I quickly kicked him in the sensitive area, causing him to vomit on the bed. Amanda watched this horrific scene, tears streaming down her face. You despicable woman, don't even think about going home. I'll take your things to your parents and you can stay there. Mark growled at her before leaving. I followed him, preferring to remain silent. It was obvious that my brother was in no condition to engage in conversation. Once outside, Mark immediately grabbed a pair of wire cutters and began to cut off all the valve rods on Amanda's car. This will undoubtedly take her a lot of time to repair the car. We returned to Mark's house in complete silence. Our next task was to carefully pack all of Amanda's clothes and personal belongings into sturdy boxes, which we then carefully loaded into the car. I only caught a glimpse of Amanda's parents during the wedding, so I wasn't sure of their possible reaction when I found out that their daughter was coming home. Together, Mark and I diligently unloaded all the boxes, carefully placing them on the doorstep of the house. I stood aside while Mark rang the doorbell. Amanda's mom asked, Mark, why are you here and what are these boxes? Mark replied, These are all Amanda's things. Since we are no longer married, I thought she might come back here. He picked up the phone and showed her the video, explaining, That's why we're breaking up. Amanda's mom was shocked and almost fainted. We helped carry the boxes into the house, and Mark kindly offered to give me a ride home. I invited him to come into the house. He declined the offer, expressing a desire to be alone. At that time, the twins were fast asleep, and I decided to check on them before joining Laura in the living room and telling her about the events that had just happened. Laura was visibly stunned by Amanda's unexpected behavior and couldn't hide her grief. When the divorce process began, the situation quickly got out of control. Amanda initially suggested contacting a professional psychologist, but Mark strongly rejected the idea, saying that their marriage was already over. At that time I did not know that Amanda had been in a relationship with two other men for almost six months which further complicated the situation. After discovering that Mark was not interested in saving their marriage, Amanda resorted to desperate measures, ruthlessly demanding everything she could get her hands on. But her actions came to an end when Mark issued a warning, threatening to release the video to her employers. Realizing the futility of her actions, Amanda reluctantly admitted the collapse of their union and agreed to the terms offered by Mark. Although the specific details remain unknown, it is obvious that she faced an unfavorable outcome. Shortly after the divorce was finalized, Amanda launched a smear campaign against my brother, venting her grievances to anyone who would listen to her. During a rare party where my parents kindly looked after Laura and me, an unfortunate incident occurred. While we were chatting with a small group of friends, Amanda launched into a venomous tirade. Before I could intervene, Laura boldly stood in front of Amanda. If you were going to have a promiscuous sex life like an ordinary whore, why did you bother to marry Mark? Laura challenged her, her words filled with justified anger. Mark didn't deserve to be treated so badly, Amanda. You're a despicable person. Amanda stood in stunned silence when Laura's hand touched her cheek with a ringing slap. Let's refrain from using obscene language so as not to escalate the situation. Laura warned, ending the tense moment. Why didn't you disclose the details of your stay in a hotel room with two men? It's terrible and insulting. You have disappointed me very much. You are just a libertine. Laura returned to our group, 
and Amanda quietly left the pub, leaving many people laughing at her. Later that evening I told my parents about what had happened. My father chuckled and said that Amanda deserved everything that happened. When I was alone with my mother, I asked her a question. I asked her if she regretted that I still hadn't found a girl as amazing as Amanda. In response, mom looked at me and smiled, as if acknowledging her previous mistake. 